Well, hello everyone, and welcome back. I totally forgot to pull this up on my phone so I can watch the live chat. My bad. Um, that's just the kind of producer I am. Uh, welcome. So today, we're not doing uh, silly creationist nonsense uh, like we normally do on Thursdays. Uh, we're talking about something a little bit more substantive. Uh, we're talking about the species problem, or problems, uh, depending on how you define it, I guess. Uh, joining me for this conversation, of course, is my host and co-host, Peter, as always. Welcome. Who's who's in the background? Uh, who's in the background? For this who's stuff? in the background? Yeah. Um, and also joining me is, uh, uh, we have Will Ratcliffe, uh, who is a, a reluctant veteran of the channel, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> veteran, yes. Reluctant, no. Yeah, it's great to, great to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. We really enjoyed having you on last time, and so I was, I was really excited when uh, you're interested to come back on. So yeah, it's great to be here. I guess I mean, I'll briefly introduce myself. Yes. yes. Oh gonna... well. Yes. Uh, one second. We'll first get uh, our third guest. Uh, or fourth. I don't. I guess it depends on how you define Peter. Uh, welcome. This is Jesse Shapiro. Welcome to the show. Hi. Great to be here. First time participant. Yes. Well, glad to have you. I'm excited. Um, as I was just saying, I normally we do uh, silliness normally on Thursday. We we um, either watch creationist videos or uh, read creationist drivel or something along those lines. It's all very fun. Uh, nothing <laughs> nothing is as as uh, highbrow as what we're doing today. So, <laughs> um, so first, uh, yes, for anyone who's not aware, uh, we're gonna get your background. So, uh, Will, I think you volunteered. Uh, you can sure. go first with your background. Yeah, I'm an evolutionary biologist at Georgia Tech. Uh, I study primarily the evolution of multicellularity in yeast. So we have a long-term evolution system where we're started with a single-celled yeast and we're about five years into a planned 30-year-long experiment where we're actually evolving them to become gradually more multicellular. We also inc include a lot of mathematical modeling and computational approaches to sort of wrap a holistic wrapper around this problem and understand how increasingly complex life evolves. So I yes. don't work on speciation, <laughs> but uh, no, that's, I'm best. I think some of your work bears on this question. I'll be interested to get your opinion on it at some point. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we we, um, we went over a lot of your uh, yeast research uh, last time, uh, a lot of very interesting stuff. So I'm always interested to read to see more papers that have uh, your name or a uh, uh, Bosdag or uh, oh, yeah. other people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, Dr. Shapiro, if you'd like to give a uh, background on yourself. Is he frozen? Oh, no. I think he might be frozen. Oh, wait. I see you moving now. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. It was a little bit choppy, but I think it's okay. Um, yeah. Hopefully it's not on my end. Um, anyway. Uh, Let's give it a shot. I can hear you fine, man. Yeah, you sound fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think. Uh, I, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah. Off and on, it it kind of it kind of stops and starts. But it seems fine at this moment. Okay, let me try. Okay. So, hi, I'm Jesse Shapiro. I'm also. Oops. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> we'll never find out who he is. <laughs> Should I try to introduce Jesse? <laughs> Maybe. Usually I have the worst internet here, so, you know, that's comforting mm. for me. Jesse, we can't hear you. I guess I'm going to put in the side chat, too. Can't hear you. Yeah, if you'd like to introduce 
uh, Dr. Shapiro, that's fine. Yeah, so I've I've known uh, Dr. Shapiro for a long time. We go to the same conferences. I'm pretty sure we first met maybe 14 years ago. Um, and he's a microbiologist, an evolutionary biologist at McGill University, and he studies environmental micro environmental microbes, also in a laboratory context. And he's written some really cool papers on um, thinking about species in systems that typically don't receive rigorous treatment, or at least are difficult to apply rigorous treatment to, like asexual, uh, asexually reproducing microorganisms, and even viruses. And I think he has like really deep knowledge in thinking about this problem in non-canonical systems, and is a perfect guest for this episode. Yes, I was very, uh, I was very intrigued uh, when you suggested him. I was like, heck yeah. Um, I am a, uh, just a poor little zoology guy. Uh, so I'm also not a species expert. Um, I have, I, I have my, um, I suppose my opinions from a distance, but, uh, this is not my, not my area. So, uh, but I, I, I think a lot about this, uh, question, in regards to sort of how we use words uh, more broadly in biology. And I know you, one of the questions that you provided is, is about that. And I'm intrigued to talk about that uh, because one of the things that I do often get into arguments, uh, particularly with creationists about is the concept of kinds, because they'll say, yeah, species are fine, but what is a kind, right? And that's not too far afield. Uh, in some cases, species and kind may be very similar in other cases they may be okay he's trying to rejoin they may be a bit more more separate okay um and so i've had to do a lot of like you know i've had a lot of conversations uh trying to suss out like what is the definition of a kind or uh complexity is another interesting one like what does complexity mean i know they're mathematical yeah. that you know, one's and... that one's rough <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I use that term a lot, and I I struggle with it because it's very much in the eye of the beholder. There, at least with species, I think we have some heuristic idea that we're talking about the same thing. But one person's complexity is not someone else's complexity. That's true. Okay. Uh, how you, it's all good. Hey guys, uh, I'm can back. You hear us? I think. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. All right. I don't know what's happening. I just have a really lousy connection. I think it's probably. Everyone in my neighborhood's watching Netflix right now, or something like that. Um, uh, makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. If you want to, uh, your <laughs> uh, Will gave a, a bit of background for you, but if if you would like to uh, give us some of your background, in oh, your, that's good. Will introduced oh, that's and things like that. Will did uh, yeah. Will introduced me. Perfect. Well, please, <laughs> and I didn't get to hear it. So, hey, if there's anything that. you want to mention about like your research interests or projects, things like that. Sure. Um, well, so I'm a, I'm a uh, professor at McGill University um, in the microbiology department, but I'm also a ecologist and evolutionary biologist, microbial genomics person by, by training. Um, and I study how mostly bacteria um, evolve in the wild, really, um, looking at, at pathogens and natural populations more or less in their natural context, basically by doing a lot of genome sequencing and stuff like that. So I've, um, I have worked on speciation sort of by uh, stumbling into it, I guess, I suppose. Um, mm. And now I'm, I'm, I remain, I remain interested in it, but it's, I find that it's a hard thing to study, um, I guess, Um, at least for me, um, I guess having stumbled into it, um, it's hard to actively pursue those questions all the time. So in that sense, I'm I'm like a few years removed from my very active work on that, but um, it's still definitely an area of interest and sort of something that I try to keep my eye on. But anyway, I'm kind of looking back on on some of my work with uh, a little bit of perspective and sort of what's come what's what's come since. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, I, I know you probably don't know me. So uh, as I was just saying, um, I'm just a mere little zoology guy. So also for me, species is like not what I do. 
Um, my, I, I uh, for my thesis, I was doing uh, stuff on on dung beetle iridescence. So you know, species, the process of speciation is way a field of all that. So, um, so yeah, I I find this all very interesting. Um, because I, I think you know, linguistic ontology in general is a very interesting. Uh, field and what the correspondence is between how we use words and the natural world and all that sort of stuff. Of course, that's the heart of the species problem, right? Is how does this term correspond with reality? Uh, so, um, I guess I'll I'll throw out. Um, I like like I said, I like uh, Will's questions uh, more than my own, though. I'll probably uh, sneak them at some point. Um, so. Well, we'll uh, your first question was, uh, what are what are species and what are the main uh, species concepts? You guys want to tackle that one or those ones? I'm ha happy to give a very high level intro, then maybe Jesse can pick it up. Sounds good. OK, I was uh, homework. I was rereading a, my my own 2016 papers. This is what happens when you get old. Is, is better like you took the thing, intro. What, I know. Let, let me reread that paper that I really wrote. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Anyway. Uh, you, you take the intro then. That's awesome. Okay, okay. Well, you know, I, I think broadly, um, in a colloquial sense, you know, we we know species when we see them. Um, you know, so I think that there is something natural. There's a search for what's a natural unit, but um, natural in sort of a biological sense. But I think even in a very colloquial sense. You know, people have always kind of looked at things and named things. And we, we, I, I think as, as, as humans, we're um, pretty, pretty adept at just making our own. There's an innate psychological tendency there, in a sense. I think so. To, I to think categorize. so. And that's not, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll venture to say that. Um, yeah. uh, but I think what we're talking about are clusters, right? So that there isn't just a, a, a general continuum of, of mush you mm -hmm. know there's a duck and there's a bear and and you know we can we can tell that there's an oak tree and you can point at them and tell the difference um and these are clusters of and as we have better ways of looking at things you know microscopes um genome sequencing technology things like that we can have genetic definitions so we can see genetic clusters we can see ecological clusters so things that inhabit an ecological niche right so if species have have a unique function to to use that that word in an ecosystem um so i think those are the, kind of the, the general um ideas there um and we can yeah we can go and from i think there. I'll, I'll i'll add two more things one which is dynamically species arise because of breaks in gene flow within a population in which there's interaction right this is the way i typically think of this is you know between a duck and a and an oak tree there is no exchange of genetic information. They're discrete. They are evolving in their own independent, you know, they may be dependent through an interaction, but there's no genetic information that's being shared between the two. And so the process of speciation is, is one sort of intermingling population that diverges and breaks that gene flow and is able to sort of become two discreetly evolving lineages and populations, which, which are the units, sort of the, you know, the things, the entities that are evolving, not individuals, populations. Um, and so the, the main species concepts, uh, I'd say there are sort of three that are the most common. There's many more. If we actually looked at the long tail of species concepts, there's probably 10, I don't know, 20, 30. Like there's many, there's many. And they've been there's proposed. At least seven. Yeah, they've been proposed many times to, to solve various problems with the ones that exist, which sort of foreshadows that there's no one species concept that is the one true species concept that is correct. But the three that I teach in my intro evolution class are the biological species concept, which was popularized by Ernest Mayer in the early 50s, which is pretty simple and easy to understand. And that says that, you know, two, uh, two species are distinct species if they cannot have fertile offspring. Um, there's variations on it, you know, whether or not they do in nature or simply have the capacity to is sometimes argued. But yeah, I mean, this makes sense, right? A, a horse and a donkey are distinct species. They can make a mule, but the mule's sterile. And so there is no gene flow between those two, right? You can see that barrier to gene flow in the in the in, in, inability for them to have fertile offspring. Um, there's, but this has problems, which I'm sure we'll get to in a second. There's a phylogenetic species concept, which rather than looking directly at the ability for things to, to, to mate, says, okay, if we look at sort of the tree 
of, of uh, the phylogenetic tree, the sort of tree of life of how these things diverge from common ancestors, you can get distinct groups, which we would call clades, which share a common ancestor, which share different common ancestors and have different traits from one another. And those would be species. Again, this works pretty well. And this solves a bunch of problems that the biological species concept has issues with. For example, the biological species concept doesn't work with organisms that are asexual because there's no sex to, to drive the gene flow. Phylogenetic species concept solves that problem, no problem, but it has its own su suite of problems. And then we often will, a more historical thing would be like a morphological species concept to go back to the fossil record and look at traits of things and sort of bend them into those into those distinct groups and say, wow, this group of things looks similar, but distinct from these other ones. And we'll use the existence of traits that we can see to make those demarcations. And there's more, but those are maybe like those three kind of capture, I think, a lot of the variation that others, you know, play with. Yeah, I I agree with um, with that. I, I guess I would add um, an ecological species concept, which I guess maybe <laughs> I alluded to in 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 yep. vague um, vague terms. Um, which, again, it's like a different way of 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 cutting things up. But um, I would say I'm a I'm a proponent of. Um, um because essentially it, it, it's this concept that a, a species inhabits an ecological niche and so doesn't compete with other things and this is related to to the other concepts um particularly the biological species concept of gene flow right because if you start that can be a mechanism that kind of starts that branching process where if you start to explore a new niche then there's going to be more gene flow within your new niche than with your relatives in the ancestral niche. And so that can sort of start to break those boundaries of, of gene flow. So I think there's also relationships between these different different mm -hmm. concepts. So, you know, what's so people will debate what's what's driving, you know, which comes first? Um, are there just barriers to gene flow that appear mm -hmm. geographically, right? So this is I'm getting mm -hmm. into the weeds here, maybe allopatric speciation where there's just like a mountain range that mm -hmm. that stops gene flow. Are there other just inherent um, genetic factors that have nothing to do with ecology? Uh, but I think actually that sort of this this um, ecological um, concept kind of I think it is important um, to mention anyway. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I I do think it is um, interesting that uh, the sort of the exceptions to the some of these concepts like like the, the biological species concept when you have like viable hybridization between what we consider as separate species, um, how that can actually be like a source of variation for, you know, these separate species. Um, of, for instance, like in different, you know, bacterial populations, there may be horizontal gene transfer uh, or uh, more rarely, you know, it, it gets harder for like a, gene transfer to occur among vertebrates after there's like more than i think it's like two two to three percent mitochondrial dna difference between the species it gets quite a bit more difficult to uh share genes but you still get stuff like that especially with like angelfish uh and and sunfish and things like this and so uh stebbins you know way back in the 1950s was like hey you know sometimes these hybridization events actually are beneficial not not always as you mentioned lots of cases there are pre and post zygotic barriers that are uh for very good reasons preventing these associations but in some cases they can be beneficial and i do think that's also uh rather interesting uh thanks to uh dr shapiro here i actually i read a, a paper last night uh, in preparation for this because i've made so many notes i never make this many notes for a talk usually because we're talking about creationists uh <laughs> and so uh, i read a paper uh you probably read it um it's like a Frederick Cohen, uh, 2002, uh, What Are Bacterial Species? Which is very interesting uh, because for uh, bacterial species, the thing that really piques my attention uh, with regard to that is the fact that you have the clustering. You have like actual statistical clustering of genetics with the, the phenotype. And that's, to me, a lot more interesting than with like the, the biological species concept, which is we have like a grade of where um, reproductive capabilities stop, you know, because uh, 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 was it Stanislavski and uh, Ravenet, I think uh, they talk about the speciation continuum 
because you have these populations who are perfectly good at you know interbreeding at or they're perfectly good at interbreeding and you know gradually gradually they get less and less good at it for different reasons maybe uh, a mountain range forms or what have you and so uh, you know you get progressively along that and it gets harder and harder to breed until you get you know something like a syngamion where you have like you have species who are still to some extent maybe not a huge extent but they're still like sharing genes with each other kind of like homo sapiens did with neanderthals and, and denisovans uh but by and large we're still you know good species for the most part and then of course you get to like fully uh uh, uh unviable inviable non-viable hybrids <laughs> so so i mean part of my like dislike uh -oh. oh no <laughs> part of my frustration with something like the biological species concept is mm -hmm. uh and and this may not be the contemporary thinking on it but is is i think people tend to be a little bit absolutist you know like mm. that there, there is no gene flow and like that's right. what makes the species is the complete lack of gene flow and mm -hmm. that's certainly like if you hit that then i think it's a it's pretty hard to argue that they are, you know, it's pretty clear they're separate species, right? Like the, the lack right. of gene flow between a duck and an oak tree. Really, I'm pretty convinced they're separate species. <laughs> right. um, you don't need like 100% lack of gene flow to have things that like by every intuitive feeling of the word species. And really, mm -hmm. I think maybe like more high dimensional scientific approaches where you're not just saying, I only care about this one thing, complete lack of gene flow, but rather something like what Dr. Shapiro's done, looking at sort of at traits in, in their ecological and genetic context and saying, these mm -hmm. things have a cluster that's far away from everything, from, from the next closest thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, for example, you know, like polar bears and grizzly bears, they can interbreed. They live in pretty similar habitats. Sometimes they do interbreed. There's a bit of gene flow going around there. Mm -hmm. But if you, look at, if you look at polar bears and grizzly bears, like they're pretty clearly different species. Same with, you know, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, different species. And yet there's still some gene flow, right? So a little gene flow is fine. Um, and I think maybe I'll just say this touches on one of the fundamental problems with categorization in science. As humans, I think we tend to want to have bright lines around things and say, mm -hmm. like, there are distinct categorical differences. Once you step over this line, even a little bit, it's a completely different territory now. And fundamentally continuous processes don't really play by those rules very well. Um, so when I say that speciation is fundamentally continuous, right? If you have one population that diverges and it gradually gets further and further apart in their ecological context, their genetic context, there's less and less gene flow. You know, you have polar bears here and grizzly bears here. Mm -hmm. They're really quite different. There's still a little bit of gene flow, but they, yeah. you know, this process of speciation of gradual divergence, that's, unquestionably happening, right? You can see these things getting further apart through time. But when do they become a new species? When do they cross that line? Like that's one of these categorization problems that doesn't really have a satisfying answer in nature because there is no like threshold that you flip over that makes it happen all of a sudden, it, you know? And, and I think like something like grizzly bears and polar bears bears that out, no pun intended. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that you look at them, they're clearly different species and yet they haven't made this complete lack of gene flow break yet. So you don't really need that like complete cessation. And this isn't, this is really common in biology, but it's not even a fundamentally biological problem. Uh, you could take something as simple as colors and the color spectrum of light, right? And I know mm -hmm. what blue is, and I know what green is, right? Like, and I, if I show you blue and green, you can identify the two and say, those are different colors. Mm -hmm. But the transition from one to the next is continuous and there is really no bright line when you switch from being blue to green right it doesn't just switch all of a sudden so speciation is i think i think of it in that sense that like we're going from maybe a blue green intermediate to blue and green those are becoming distinct but there's no point at which it suddenly switches to a new color it's it's shades of something that's continuous rather than discrete categories that have just firm walls around them Oh, I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, that's the issue with like with like the, the syngamians, for instance. Like, yeah, you're right. We are separate species uh, uh, genetically, morphologically from Neanderthals and Denisovans. And, you know, there are different species of oak in, in the genus Quercus, uh, even if there is sure. you know, some degree of of gene flow. So I would 100 percent agree with you that absolutist 
um, no gene flow whatsoever ever um, can't you know can't be the um, the it's a pretty the, high uh, bar <laughs> right because even as as it was just pointed out by Nestling in the side chat um, I don't know if you heard about the paper in which uh, paddlefish and sturgeons had a hybrid uh, no I'm looking at the comments now cool uh, in 2020 there was a paper that came out um, so these um, these researchers uh, were keeping uh, I believe it was in Russia they were keeping uh, some are you still there? No, no, it's just <laughs> no, it's just us. Did we lose everyone? Yeah, okay, I'm back now. Sorry, I was trying to click okay. on the comments. No, you're fine. I was like, uh oh, we lost everybody. <laughs> um, the uh, so the researchers are really sad about Dr. Shapiro having yeah. internet problems. Yeah, um, if he if he comes uh, back, Jackson, you might you might uh, want to suggest to him that uh, maybe turning off his camera just by clicking okay. at the bottom of the screen. Uh, uh that that okay. might help I'll, I'll message i'll try i'll message him that maybe try without camera um okay um anyway so these researchers were keeping uh paddlefish and sturgeon in the same holding tank because you know they were doing different things with them and they were like well they're not gonna hybridize their common ancestor was 125 million years ago you know <laughs> right. um and then lo and behold there was a um a a uh paddle paddle sturgeon that <laughs> paddlegen that <laughs> resulted mm. uh, which is very bizarre so that's cool um yeah, yeah it was super okay he says it. here we go again dr uh, shapiro can you hear us yes can you hear me yes we can hear you right. I video my i think i think it's on my end it's just very slow um bad timing to be at home um all right so i heard like some <laughs> snippets of conversation yeah go ahead Mostly ducks and oak trees and uh, uh, and, and things. Um, no, sorry, I, I basically genders. missed everything that was discussed. <laughs> just assume um, that I did not. Basically, but, uh, that's okay. Just let's, saying, let's carry on. Okay, uh, you're basically uh, you're basically just saying um, that like you know you can recognize species, but that doesn't have to necessarily be a hard and fast species boundary. You know, some sort of absolutist boundary to consider or to recognize what is a species and what isn't. Yeah, I, I think, and I, I heard some of the things Will was saying, and which I agree with, and I, I personally um, think that it's a lot easier to talk about the process of speciation. Totally. Mm -hmm. as, you know, spe species as a verb, speciation as a, a process, than mm -hmm. species as entities. And um, in that sense, you know, everything is somewhere on that continuum, right, where mm -hmm. every every new mutation that happens sort of a you know hopeful monster uh that you know maybe maybe that'll be the mutation and thinking from a bacterial perspective you know that that lets you uh use a new carbon source and inhabit a new niche and sort of go off on a new evolutionary trajectory right um it's unlikely but it could be right that you're just at that very very first step um and then there'll be more mutations that will accumulate genetic in incompatibilities, barriers to gene flow, all this kind of stuff, right? So things can be really early on that trajectory, um, but never really go anywhere, right? So maybe, and, and, and this is also where you kind of get into, you know, what is very variation within a species, right? So like there, it, there is genetic variation within, within a species, right? Not everybody is the same, right? There are differences, but are those differences relevant enough to sort of to to send a population off on its own separate trajectory so i think you know that's a that's a question that you can investigate um and i think those early it's it's hard to draw the cutoff where it's it's very early but you know when you get to the duck and oak tree stage it becomes it becomes clear but sort of those those mm -hmm. early stages are, are hard to distinguish we did it folks we solved the species problem good night <laughs> <laughs> can I can I just add on to that? Which yeah, is that absolutely. I, I actually think that this way of thinking, of thinking about dynamics and not states, is really helpful. Uh, and we we see this all the time in our own research, thinking about the evolution of multicellularity, which is another transition in state, right, from being a single celled organism to a multi celled organism. And people want to say, what what are the traits that it has to have to be multicellular? And nobody agrees on what those things are. Same with what does it mean to be complex? Nobody agrees, right? And I like to describe it as a as being akin to the philosophical rich man, poor man problem. So like, 
if I took everyone in Atlanta where I live and lined them up in order of their net worth, right? Be a long line of people. Um, I could start on the, you know, the rich side of things, the Ted Turner side, right? And get in my go-kart and drive down it and rich, rich, rich. And if I ask you to, you know, stop when I hit the first person who's not rich, you couldn't, right? There's no way to discretize. There's no like dollar figure that you get one dollar less and you're no longer rich. That doesn't really make sense. That's the mm -hmm. same for speciation, right? The, and yet, right, there's no sort of bright line where all of a sudden you're you're not one thing that you were before. Same for the evolution of multicellularity, same for complexity. And yet you can very easily show which direction you're going in. You can show that I've gone from more rich to less rich, and you can quantify that. It's measurable and it's clear. And so in the same way that we can show something is evolving in you know, novel multicellular traits, we can show that it's evolving increased multicellular complexity by getting multiple parts and having increased integration of the lower level units. Or that we can show that a population is undergoing a process of speciation by diverging in ecological space, in genetic space, and you can measure that over time. Uh, those things are really clear and are really helpful. And so I, you know, I think whenever possible, I tend to frame things in that context rather than what are the, the criteria required to change state? How are the states changing over time? And how does that give us insight into, you know, things that would that if you compound the that that generative process over many generations, you get to very different outcomes. You know, if if I drive down the rich, you know, the rich man line long enough, I will get to a very to to, to poor people, right? Like given sufficient time, right? And but you don't have to go very far to show the trajectory. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think we also kind of in in that discussion answered whether or not we think species are real. So I think we can probably move uh, the next. Can one. I? OK, can I add an interesting philosophical work out there? Shoot. I think species are real. Certainly, you know, you, you can't look at oak trees and ducks and, and, you know, think species aren't real because, you know, clearly they are. But at the same time, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that we can categorize everything as belonging to a clear species. And those are separate yeah, I, questions, right? I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's well put. And uh, yeah, that's it. I think species, species nihilism, you know, and I, I, I think uh, it's very, I, I think it's also to try to talk, it's, I, I, and this gets into semantics a little bit, but, or, or even just communication, right? I think to write a paper, or a book or have this conversation without using the word. And you do see people sort of go through hoops to not do it and not commit um, is, is just difficult and, and kind of unrealistic, right? So I think it's worth questioning, you know, if someone's talking about species A, species B to say like, oh, are those, are those really distinct? What do you mean by that? Why, da, 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 da. you know, it, it doesn't, it, it can be questioned, but then it's, still very much useful to use those those terms i think yeah yeah um <clears throat> yeah I, I think i agree with that um also one an example i like to bring up <clears throat> is the um you guys have probably heard of it the the insatina the salamanders in california is which, that a where species? you have <clears throat> yeah um you know, coin and or criticizes like oh it's not a perfect ring species which is anything in biology ever perfect i doubt it but um but like you have, you know, the population starts at the top and it goes around uh, Death Valley and then meets at the at the bottom at the end and they can no longer interbreed. Pretty straightforward. Um, and if you actually do the, the phylogenetics of them, they cluster into two separate clades, the blotched on one side and the unblotched on the other and, you know, and so on. So, um, so when you show people that, you're like, okay, well, clearly... Incitina uh, exchultsi exchultsi and Incitina exchultsi clauberi down here way at the bottom, which can interbreed, but they can interbreed along the arms of the the complex, you know, where whence cometh the species, you know, and something like that. Um, and so, like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I mean, clearly the, the literature cl classifies all of them as one species, Incitina exchultsi, but that gets to the but that kind of comes to the problem like okay well these two populations within this one species can't interbreed anymore so are they part of the complex are they you know 
are they part of the same species? Are they not? You know, how do you how do you define that? What do you guys think? So my my thoughts on this are that you know, I, there is no one species concept that applies for all living systems, right? And different species concepts will work better in, under different you know with different substrates of population structure of organism life history. Um, the biological species concept won't work at all for, you know, uh, asexual <laughs> organisms, for example, so you have to use something else. Mm. And so to a certain extent, I think you need to use the species concept that is useful, given the scientific questions that you're addressing. Mm. And so, I, you know, I think philosophically, there isn't a correct species concept. There are species concepts that are that are more or less useful to the person using them. Because we see species. We understand that species represent biological divergence, and we use species concepts to formalize that heuristic understanding of divergence, and we do it in a way that, frankly, is useful to our to our scientific purposes. Um, and so, in this case, I might apply a phylogenetic species concept, and uh, or perhaps if I'm doing something that has more conservation-minded approach, right? I would. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I think actually a phylogenetic species. So again, like these things feel a little bit arbitrary. That's part of, that's part of my problem with species is like, you know, they, they are to yeah. a certain extent mm -hmm. without these clear lines, it feels a little bit arbitrary and you'll get different answers based on what concepts you use. Um, yeah, yeah. And no, it, I, and it I, matters, I, right. <laughs> there are real world implications of how, of what you choose yeah. to use. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. You know, I haven't thought about ring species that much but you know in this this example right you know and again to bring the ecological species concept back into it you know if you take those two mm. species and you compete like would one out compete the other are, are they are they effectively inhabiting the same niche so that there's competitive exclusion where they they meet or if you were to kind of just mix them up um and i guess that comes into conservation right in the sense that do we want yeah. to preserve both of these species right. because they are each unique and ecologically important and different enough i'm doing air quotes you know enough to to matter um for for conservation purposes um mm -hmm. you know so I, I i again i think it 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 does it does depend and you know like will said um it depends on your i i think it's interesting to look at these contrasting cases right because there's other cases where you don't get that sort of ring, that divergence followed by, oh, they can't interbreed anymore. You actually do get, oh, there's hybridization, right? Um, so that's so like some, some species do that, others don't. Um, and so what, you know, but so I think the, the interesting question is why, you know, is it that these, um, these lizards, that, that it's just, it's easy somehow to build up genetic incompatibilities. It happens really quickly um, relative to other some other organism where there's just way more hybridization, right? There's examples in lots of different plants and butterflies and things like that. Um, and, you know, so why is there something about the genetic architecture? I think it, it you know, it kind of gets, it gets you into the sort of why questions and the mechanism questions rather than focusing on, well, like, is it or isn't it? You know, that's, that's kind of a, kind of a boring question. Although, you know, I will say for some pragmatic purposes, conservation, and this brings us back to, not being species nihilists you do want to just mm. you want to name things so you for for what for example you can protect them you can catalog you can you, you can catalog them you could say you know this is different from this um and sometimes it's easy but some i get you know sometimes there's these hard hard cases um that you know give biologists something to something to do <laughs> let me throw one more little thing on there which is that yeah. if you if 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 i was a conservation biologist working on this ring species <clears throat> and I thought it was important that we preserve the diversity of the ring and the fact that we have that it's not one thing. It's a continuum, right? If you call it just one species, then you lose the ability to protect the entire diversity of the spectrum because you could just protect mm -hmm. one piece of it. And look, maybe, maybe, especially if there's a lot of population in one region and not that much in others, right? Whereas if mm -hmm. you can subdivide it in a way that's frankly, somewhat artificial to take this continuum and chop it up the way that we chop up the visible spectrum into discrete colors, right? 
to take something which is continuous and chop it up into multiple discrete pieces and say, look, these are just different enough. We're going to call them different species. Now I can argue for increased, you know, resources for protection because I want to preserve the diversity of the entire ring. That's my goal. Then sure. I mean, like, you know, again, there is no kind of right answer here. Like there are useful, more or less useful species concepts. And when you have these really weird situations where it doesn't fit <clears throat> natural bright lines, then to a certain extent, you have to make somewhat arbitrary decisions that fit your goals that are that are more or less useful to your to your science. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, Dr. Shapiro, I want to throw a question to you. Um, I was, I'm fascinated with the the concept of ecotypes in bacterial species. Um, <clears throat> what is <clears throat> Could you say for the audience what the difference is between bacterial species and ecotypes uh, and uh, how are these concepts uh, related? If you would. Yeah, know. well, this depends who you ask. Um, and and it's, a, it's a term that I think people use differently. So Fred Cohen um, developed a species concept that is based on ecotypes. So in that sense, ecotypes are species. That is the species definition and it's an ecological species concept where species of bacteria um, each inhabit a unique niche and um, they are genetically distinct from other species and their fate is um, as a species and is uncoupled from other species, right? Because there's natural selection will purge out neutral diversity within a species, but not between. There'll be these periodic selective sweeps, but the limits of where selection can act really is within that, that niche. Um, so it is, it, it's an ecological species concept that um, is also linked to genetic diversity where you get genetic clusters that are, are ecological clusters. And so that's, that's Fred Cohen's stable ecotype model, which is a species concept. Ecotype also gets used kind of colloquially by microbial ecologists who maybe don't don't quite um, know whether they should be talking about a species or not. So mm. sometimes it, it it will refer to subspecies diversity where it's like, oh, well, we've got two strains of what we think is the same species, but, um, you know, we, we find them in different places. Um, you know, they like live, uh, growing at high temperature or low temperature or something like that. So they're, they're ecotypes and concepts are related because actually maybe, you know, what is named as a species E. coli, something like that, right. Um, was named, um, you know, 150 years ago or something like that, uh, for, for certain purposes. And now we're actually realizing, oh, wait, there's, there's not, not a great example of, of, well, sure. You know, maybe there, is, this is a, a made up example, but. You know, high temperature and low temperature specialized E. coli, and we're going to call those ecotypes. So, you know, are are those just variants within a species, or are there actually two species of E. coli, and the ecotypes are the species? So, I guess oh, hopefully I didn't make that too confusing. But there is a specific species concept based on ecotypes, and then there is a kind of colloquial use where I think people aren't exactly sure. And you might want you probably you need to do some work basically to decide if what you're calling ecotypes are species or if you're kind of talking about within species diversity and like what's the difference between those those two things. I hope that was clear and not too. Jesse, would you yeah. say yeah. roundly? <laughs> no, I thought it made sense. <laughs> would you say ecotypes are kind of similar to like varieties that other people would use in different systems? It's like the microbial version of like a of a subspecies or, or a variety or, you know, some colloquial thing. It's like, there's clearly some sort of heritable distinct difference here, but I don't know if it rises to the level of really being a species. Yeah. I think in the colloquial sense, yes. Yeah. Fred Cohen would say, would probably say no, would say, no, those are the, spe like, those are the species right. given mm -hmm. a particular definition. If they're genetic and ecological clusters, that are delimited by natural selection. Those are, it's an ecotype, which is synonymous with species. But I think that in the colloquial yeah. sense, you'd say, oh yeah, I've got ecotype A and B of E. coli, um, something like that. And this is why I don't love that term, or at least colloquially, I also don't love the uh, terms like 
strain or clone or because mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like is it there then it's just you're are you talking about a species or like what what does that what does that mean why are you defining this as something that is um subspecies diversity but what what makes it worth naming and if so should it just be a species basically um mm, right uh wasn't there an experiment uh i think it was with uh pseudomonas uh, fluorescens where they basically took like a, an original population and then sort of uh, caused them through natural uh, or through artificial selection to like divide into sort of their own separate micro habitats and they became like ecotypes we talking trevisana the famous paper i think so <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, yes, are... they were using <laughs> ecotypes in that more sort of colloquial sense, right? Rather than like a, these are like separate new species, right? Yeah, I mean they differ like one or two genes, so okay. they have very very different ecological habitats. They have very different, you know, like one becomes a mat former at the surface, which spe specializes mm -hmm. on oxygen growth. You have one that basically uh, hangs out in the, in the in the broth, and there's actually even more variation on that. But that's the major two categories: like right. form a mat along the surface or hang out in the broth that's got lower oxygen. And you just need one or two genes to change, and you get that. So they're really different ecologically, but genetically, they're not. Yeah, okay. yeah, but that's a great, that's an interesting case, right? Where if you let that go for generations and generations and generations, would you know? would is, is that a speciation trajectory right um mm. eventually would you would you accumulate enough incompatibilities and and that that you know they'll get more and more mutations and so on and adapt better and better to those niches so i think that is a it's an interesting an interesting case of you know that can be sort of like the first a first step towards speciation no it's all or nothing yeah you're either a species or you're not. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Let's just um, call everything by their 14 digit serial number instead correct. of their name. And we'll just identify clusters and in sort of some sort of high dimensional Euclidean space. We'll talk about the difference from the center of means of those clusters. And then we don't need to use this word species or even give them Latin names. I, exactly. I made a joke like that once uh, on a stream with my friend Dapper Dinosaur. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> Did we say we only wanted to go like an hour? Uh, I don't want to take Probably. too much of your time. I, I uh, have to put the kids to bed. My wife's at a function tonight, so I gotcha. uh, so, got it. So we'll go about ten more minutes then. Okay. Um, I do want to ask because I, it's a burning question: Are your multicellular uh, yeast end products are they a different species from your unicells, or what do you think? So I thought about this because because you put it in the in the chat and. Basically, I think it's not a relevant question. I'm gonna die. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh I, I, I think <laughs> I think species are are useful under some contexts, and in this context, I don't think it's very useful in the sense that it's kind of like the pseudomonas thing. Ecologically, in terms of the traits that they have, they're really different, right? They're forming cells that are. That instead of being little round spheres, they're hot dog shaped. And they're forming these groups that are huge, million cell groups. They're really biophysically tough. They're undergoing beginnings of cell specialization. They don't revert back to single cell anymore. Like they're really mm -hmm. adapting as multicellular mm -hmm. organisms. But they're like 100 mutations away from the ancestor. And if you put this on like a broader map of what yeast look like genetically, they're still in the very freaking middle of the forest. They are right. not on the edge of the forest. They are not very different from other yeast. Other yeast are way more different. We call them the same species. So if I mean, really okay. if I have to answer, I would say no. They're not. There's they are the same species. They're not different, right? They're the same species. Um, but in terms of the things that kind of matter to me, they're changing really rapidly. It just doesn't take that much genetic space to accommodate a lot of phenotypic and ecological change and they're on that trajectory right they're okay. they are in the, okay. they're in, the, in the process of what would will drive speciation given sufficient time oh now you're just trying to appease me i mean no <laughs> this this is honestly how i how i think about it okay um, yeah that's yeah. fair uh we do have a question from the audience uh can can you bake bread or beer brew with them and have yes, you tried you can definitely bake bread and beer brew uh 
I've never tried baking bread. We have therefore tried. are the same species, baker's yeast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can try. Uh, you can you can make oh, alcohol. Like with them. They do it just fine. Uh, it's really nasty though. It's you, like, <laughs> it's like toilet hooch grade. Is it uh, is it alcohol. is it macroscopic? Will is it? <laughs> <laughs> it expands your mind maybe it's maybe really you know? <laughs> <laughs> gives you a macroscopic perspective um no we actually a couple of years ago we collaborated with a brewery to do some and we evolved their their brewing strains to because you know you want a strain that already tastes good as a unicell and start with that uh and so so we even you know we went we we, we got some cool snowflake yeast there but then the pandemic hit and everything shut down i don't even think they're in business anymore but um we went so far as to come up with funny names for the different kinds of beer we were going to brew. The best one was a uh, ahoptosis, the higher level <laughs> selection. That's pretty funny. <laughs> um, I do. I guess I'll throw one more serious question out there, then we'll do a silly one uh, if we get if we if time. Um, so <clears throat> our. Uh, Oh no, it's hard to pick. Uh, okay, are yeah, the are species unique uh, in this uh, having this like difficult uh, ontological status, or are there other concepts in biology that are also similarly uh, difficult to define, uh, such as individuals, organisms, fitness? Uh, Doctor Shapiro, you want to take that one? Yeah, well, I think Will, you know, kind of uh, touched on this already right um in terms of well you know the de what's the distinction between individuals or, or uh um what's multicellular and what's unicellular and how and can we agree and i think broadly this this does i think it kind of collapses down into but everything always collapses down in evolutionary biology is the levels of selection uh oh I think we lost him again. I oh, know. Can't hear you. Uh -oh, we were doing so well. Can't hear you. Okay, well. Well, uh, well wait, you don't have to come back. My, my um, silly question is, <coughs> I'm, okay, so are you familiar with the universal species concept? <laughs> no. Okay, so I was reading this, the Cohen paper I referenced earlier last night, mm. uh, and he proposes a a uh, universal species concept, which has three, essentially three criteria. It's a species is a population with a particular set of cohesive forces, like either the clustering in bacteria or uh, gene flow for eukaryotes. Uh, oh, I think he's back. I'm back. I'm back. Okay, you can, you can continue. Right. Okay. Oh, right. So, I yeah. Yeah. Um levels of selection right so natural mm -hmm. selection can act on genes it can act on genomes it can act on populations it can act on arguably you know communities or groups right um and this is this has been controversial but i think you know it can be stronger at different levels of organization and again it, it's acting on all of those levels probably to varying extents but what's the most relevant one and i think well that's i think that kind of encompasses a lot of you know, some confusion in, in, in evolutionary biology. And it is, you know, it's, there's more than one thing. And I think Will can, Will more than me can probably speak to, to that, right? But selection on different levels of organization, and which is relevant. And there isn't, there isn't just one, you can view it from diff different perspectives. Um, so I think that's another example. Um, it's a great example. And it parallels the species debates perfectly in that <clears throat> there are different definitions for what constitutes a transition in individuality when an organism and, and actually philosophers separate individuality from organismality, even though for most things, they're the same. Um, but there is again, no one way that is the correct way to denote what constitutes a biological individual or what constitutes a new kind of organism. Um, and there are ways that I think are more natural than others. <laughs> and that I certainly have my own strong preferences uh, for, for how to do this. I like to use uh, a Peter Godfrey Smith's Darwinian individuality framework. Um, that was a good Kat paper. Yeah, it's a great paper. And Katrin Hammerschmidt uh, and Carolyn Rose have a really wonderful uh, 
follow-up called What Do We Mean by Multicellular? Where they sort of disambiguate. I don't even know if that's a friggin' word, but I'm going to use it. They it's just now. Totally word. Totally word. All words are made up, but some words are more made up than others. Cultural evolution speciation event right there. Um, they disambiguate. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep using it. Uh, <laughs> multicellular as like just a ver, an adjective to mean like a group of cells to a multicellular individual, which is a entity which gains adaptations through the process of natural selection. It reproduces as heritable variation of traits, gains adaptation as a result. And an organism, a multicellular organism, again, it's an adjective modifying the behavior of that collective of cells to demonstrate some level of functional integration. Um, so cells being parts that mutually interact to generate traits for the multicellular whole. Um, it's really nice work. And it also kind of highlights just how imprecise a lot of our heuristic words in biology are. We use the word, if I use the word multicellular, you may be thinking of just a simple group, or you may be thinking of a tree. And those are really different kinds of multicellularity. And yet we're using the same word to define them, right? And this type of thing happens all throughout biology. We have sort of two, I think, two interwoven challenges with language. One is that we're trying to force human categories that are often discrete onto fundamentally continuous processes. And like I said, with color, it sort of works until you start talking about transitions between the two. You know, if I, if, if you're changing the knob from blue to green, I'm stop the second it turns green. You can't really do that there. You can't do it in a way that is like philosophically defensible, <laughs> right? Um, and so that exists throughout biology. All, the, all over the place. And then the other thing is that the words that we use have heuristic meaning and they have different conventional and precise meanings that different communities use. And we don't even agree about how to apply them often. And so we have sort of these like, I don't know, have you seen uh, Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, yes. Curse yeah. of the Black Pearl. Yes. When um, <clears throat> Kira Knightley goes to the pirate ship and she's like, I like, by the code, you must give me parlay or something. And he's like, well, here's the thing about the pirate code. It's more guidelines. Right. right. And that's yeah. really definitions of biology are more guidelines than rigorous, clear, unambiguous, mathematically articulated sections of nature, the way that they are in math and the way they tend to be in physics. Biology is not really like that. It's more of guidelines than the code. I, I think uh, Nestle gave me uh, a new uh, name for the this discussion. It, it, we should rename it. What do words mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, is like in the species. Oh, uh, well, I mean, it's a collective of species, isn't it? It's a great it's a great question. We have I have a paper on this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no. uh, or if not yet, yeah, it's coming out. Uh, well, me, um, me and Eric, Eric Libby have a paper on that. You can check it out. You and uh, Eric Libby have a have a theory paper on on lichens as multicellular organisms. Not interesting. Non conventional transitions to multicellularity. I'll give you one that's even crazier. Are you eukaryotic cells a species? And why is a eukaryotic you... cell different? Yeah. So you know, a eukaryotic cell is like a weird form of multicellularity in which we have a symbiosis between right, yeah, and archaea, right, which are. Huh. initially like lineagely completely distinct and separated for you know billions of years and yeah like, now are living together in a, in a symbiosis in the way that lichens and algae are right but over time the the bacteria gets very like you know stuck and entrenched in this cell that it's living in but it's still kind of this multicellular symbiosis yeah no, degree. we just rounded down to being a cell but like it's still okay. multicellular in a weird way, right? That's true. And there are, uh, I came across an example of a, a bacterium. There's a um, a cyanobacterium that has like spirochete endosymbionts. Because oh, some cyanobacteria. They're all over the tree of life, man. Like They're in big. insects. They're all over okay. the place. Before before we go, though, I, just, I found the paper that. Wait, wait, wait. I'll just ask one one follow up question to, to your ahead. listeners since I love their question. And I like, yeah, I, I like answering philosophical questions with philosophical questions, which is, if we do think that a eukaryotic organism is a species, I don't know, a single-celled eukaryote, a flagellate, a chlamydomonas, an amoeba, but we don't think a lichen is, then what's the difference? And why would one be an a species and the other one not? That That's a fair point. 
Um, I I did want to uh, run out of the discussion with, and I want to put this to both of you. Um, this started in part because I accidentally came across a paper written in the 1970s by, was it 1970s? It was the 80s by Lay Van Valen and uh, hmm. Majorana, I think, um, on the question of whether the Henrietta Lacks uh, uh, was cervical adenocarcinoma cells, cell culture, is in fact a separate species. And last night, uh, and I was on the, eh, probably not, because it seems like that's where most biologists fall. But last night, in the Cohen paper I referenced earlier, he defined the universal species concept as having three criteria. And those criteria are a population with a particular set of cohesive forces, as in the, the phenotypic cluster, the genotype phenotype clusters of bacteria or um, gene flow within eukaryotes, having separate phylogenetic trajectories and either occupying different niches or uh, different niches in the same environment or the same niche in different environments. And based on those three criteria, I think we can conclude that the HeLa cells are a separate species. What are your thoughts for both of you guys? Jesse, are you on? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm what are your here. thoughts? Just taking, it, just taking it all in. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I, right. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. And I think that the, you know, it, the um, argument against is it just the, the it, well, it's a very early stage and how, yeah. um, how long, how transient is that, right? Um, and I, yeah, no, I mean, it's an interesting, um, <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah, basically like, you know, get back to me in like, you know, 10, in like, uh, 10 to a hundred thousand years. Okay. Yeah. Of continuing to propagate those. <laughs> right. I, I guess it, it becomes sort of trivial when, um, I don't know. I guess I just think of it as, um, yeah, you know, artificial, right? And 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 is that is is that a reason? Maybe not, right? Artificial selection. Yeah, I guess that's the question. Can artificial selection make species, or do we say... or, or 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 do we somehow not not want to count? I'd say heck yeah to that. I would think, I mean, we have lots of things that are, um, and I mean, it kind of goes back to the whole, like, um, this, the like ring species thing. Like, you know, think about like a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. There are some, uh, to put it mildly, mechanical issues with that uh, union, you know, and they're both artificial uh, inventions, you know, or uh, beings, artificial beings. Jesse, what uh, I would say is think of the lab as a niche. Is really from the yeah. from the organism's perspective, the lab is no different from nature. It's just a weird niche. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I hear that. So I, I guess my argument is mainly just about, you know, like it's not going to last. Mm -hmm. And this is where maybe to close the conversation, right? We have a, we have like everything, species. If every species has speciated, has a certain origin somewhere, and every species will go extinct. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I just think that they. Are going to go extinct and sort of in the blink of an eye and so what you know um what why um trouble ourselves <laughs> maybe it's sort of pragmatic um but yeah we have to preserve the genetics of this new species that we've just found yeah what do you what do you think dr ratcliffe oh <laughs> uh, you know if i'm honest Talking about this makes me feel a little bit icky, just given the history of this cell line. And I, you know, like I just, it feels a little disrespectful to the family to even talk about it in these terms. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to opt out. Okay, that's fair. I mean, you're right. There there has been a lot of, of uh, shady uh, pharmaceutical stuff uh, regarding that. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a better answer. <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that underlies my lack of... <laughs> not really wanting to engage <laughs> not totally fair it was more of just a uh silly kind of throw out their thing because I, I just yeah. like i accidentally came across that paper i didn't know it was a thing and it blew my mind when i read it and so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just curious any thoughts um okay yeah. well we're past the hour mark now um what would you guys uh is there anything you guys want to 
say uh, sort of in closing about this topic or what you're working on or anything you want to uh, tell us? Uh, Dr. Ratcliffe, you want to go first? I think the main takeaway for me for, for this kind of thing is to think about what we mean with our words. What do words mean? What do words mean is kind of the takeaway, right? Like, and mm. that rather than being a philosophical absolutist, that there is one way to do this and that everything must conform to my approach, which I think is a very common human approach to this kind of categorization problem, which is like, I see problems with the way it's been done, but I have a solution to that. And everyone should get with my solution because it's the what it's the right way. I think I, I would encourage people to embrace a perspective of philosophical pluralism, and say maybe there are maybe there are multiple ways to define species and they're all perfectly appropriate given and they're and they're uniquely appropriate for different contexts and then when we use species concepts we should just be clear with what we mean by the term to pre prevent confusion right so if i'm going to say i'm going to argue for you know this is this these two things are different species according according to the species concept and i'm applying it in the following ways then like, even if I didn't like that species concept, like, you know, or if you're a reviewer of that paper, don't fight them on it. Be like, cool, you're using a different concept, but you've clearly defined the way you're using it. I'm happy. We should just embrace pluralism. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shapiro. Here, here. Yeah, I subscribe to that. I, I endorse I endorse that statement. Um, I guess, yeah, I, um, I'll add just sort of a historical perspective too, right? And this, I think, is related to what will was saying you know different people meaning different things and pluralism but also just pluralism over time and i think it's pretty fascinating to look at species that have been named you know that have latin names and when they were named and why and there's a lot you know a lot of examples in bacteria have to do with disease right so shigella it it was given actually a different, different genus name than e coli but Shigella is E. coli by any mm. phylogenetic, you know, uh, it's E. coli with a plasmid, right? So it's maybe a bit more on the, on the spectrum of those pseudomonas um, in, uh, in, in the flask that are at the, at the surface or in the broth, right? Where they're like pretty similar and they, they probably have a bit of a different niche, but they probably, they exchange genes, you know, they're, they're very close. They probably should be the same species, right? But they were named because they cause different diseases, right? So I think, and on a, there's recently been a reorganization of bacterial taxonomy deep in the tree, not just species, um, but like far all the way down into, you know, phyla and, and super phyla. And, you know, microbiologists are losing their mind because they're like, what? You know, like my, my, this is my bug that I'm working on. Like you can't rename it to something that I, you know. So I think humans are we're attached to certain names, and there's a there's a there's a history to that. And again, that's sort of just a different purpose as well. And I think it's worth kind of, um, you know, retaining those things in some cons in, in for some purposes. But then there's there will be efforts to sort of change things and shake it up and say, no, I've got new data or I've got a new concept and you know, I think that's that's also just part of the, the process, sort of naming and renaming and fighting about it, and for different reasons and different purposes. And, it's a process. and I'll just I'll just throw one more thing on there, which just occurred to me, which is a uh, since spe since defining species is a human endeavor, and people want to work on these things and improve it, but if you actually want to do something with your job, you need to change things. Like you're not going to be a successful scientist if in your thesis you simply just uh, you know, you write a thesis agreeing that species definitions as they were written are perfect and should not be changed. Like, of course, you, like, you know, you're, you're like almost like you're highly motivated to argue for changes. <laughs> and because, you know, like that's kind of what we all do. We all come into a, to an area and we we leave our mark on it. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I think if, if I were to project forward, I don't think it's something which will ever stop changing. If for no other reason that than that humans as an enterprise <laughs> describing the world and successive generations will if they're going to do anything will have to change what was there before <laughs> i think they'll usually yeah. improve it too but they'll also have to change it yeah absolutely well 
Uh, thank you both again for coming on. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed having you here, uh, and I hope to get you on uh, again at some point in the future. Thanks. It's great being on. Oh. Sounds great. Yeah. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm going to try to turn my camera on for one second and wave, and I okay. might cut out, <laughs> so this might be it, but I'll try. All right. Uh, and thank you, everybody, in the side chat who was watching today. Uh, thank you so much. And we will see all of you next time. Hey, oh, hey. Right, there he is. Already. Hey. Take there. care. There's a little wave. There's a little wave. Great to see you. Thanks see a lot. You guys. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Jax. <laughs> well, I, I, I can make some graphics, so I'm getting better all the time. <laughs>